Hello world! Today's video is the first part of a series that will aim to cover one of the most important concepts of software engineering, dependency injection. From experience, developers are split into three categories concerning dependency injection, which we will call DI for brevity. The first category are those who were kind of scared of DI as a term, or they have not searched or learned much about it just yet. The second category are those who have searched about it and ended up classifying it as a simple concept with a fancy name, uh, simply passing parameters to a class. That's easy. They also know the three basic ways of doing that, and they believe that this is all. Finally, the third category, those who know for sure what developers of the second category know, plus understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg of what DI really is about. That is the category that I'm planning on putting you in, hopefully by the end of this series. The title of this video is Dependency Injection and the Illusion of Simplicity. The reason I named it like that, apart from sounding pretty cool, is that the term simple is a trap. You see, while DI is a simple concept, it's super hard to get it right in the real world. Simple is totally different from easy. Today's episode goal is to define it, then see the three basic ways of utilizing it, and ending it with some cliffhanger questions, sorry about that, that will show you how important it is to understand the part of the iceberg that is below water. A couple of videos back, we went over the term dependency, what it is and why we call it that. I will link the video in the description in case you want to go back and refresh your memory. Understanding dependencies between your classes and modules is a super essential step that will level you up as a software engineer. Most developers simply write code that wires together classes and they happen to have a relationship that is not controlled. We need to learn how to control that power to our advantage. So let's see how we can gain access to other dependencies. We can create them on the spot like that or we can use some sort of static method or singleton to gain access to a dependency, like that. Those are valid ways of obtaining dependencies. One class creates and references another. This is called an implicit dependency, as we cannot know the dependency just by looking at the class's public API. It's locked inside. When we create this class, there is no way of knowing what it depends on, just by looking at it from the outside, since its dependencies are created from within. So that is what an implicit dependency is. Dependency injection, on the other hand, is all about explicit dependencies. You are going to give classes their dependencies from the outside, therefore making it loud and clear that this class needs this particular dependency. Someone will have to create and give it to them through a number of ways we will see right now. Essentially, that's what dependency injection is, passing dependencies to classes instead of classes creating their own. Passing equals injecting. So now we know what a dependency is, of course, and we just found out what injection means, passing from the outside. But how do we do that? That's easy. Three main ways. First, the most classic and obvious one, through constructor parameters, of course. This is called constructor dependency injection. And yes, you've been performing that ever since you passed a class as an argument through a constructor. And not just that, but this is actually the most used and best way of passing a dependency into a class. It's super clear from the constructor what the dependencies are, so we know what we need to give this class in order to function properly. And also, since it happens in the constructor, we are sure that we will have those dependencies available from the first millisecond of the object's creation. They can also be final. Here's a classic example. If constructor dependency injection is a choice, available, pick that one, since it's the safest and clearest. But not all classes can be instantiated by us. If you're an Android developer, you know that the framework has made the choice that you do not instantiate activities through their constructor, in contrary to iOS, 
where you invoke view controllers constructors yourself. This is a problem for constructor dependency injection. We cannot use it. So we have to use the second way, which is field injection, often called property injection in languages like Kotlin. In other words, use a setter for a field and give it its value after the class is creation. This is useful in cases like the aforementioned, where you cannot use the constructor of a class, and also useful when there is already a default value for the field and does not need to be injected every time, but you can still change it at some point if you want. So, putting it in the constructor would force clients to inject it every single time. Of course, Kotlin, Swift, and other languages offer default constructor parameters, and you can always overload constructors in other languages, but still, you get the idea. Here's an example of field injection. Here, we already have the instance of the class, but we inject the field later through its setter. Finally, there is the concept of method injection, where you only pass a value for the scope of a single function. This will not get saved in the class, but used from a method like that. This is very useful when you need a dependency to change many times during a class's lifetime, and storing it would be useless, so you need to only use it in the context of a specific task and not store it as a main part of your class. So, what do you think? It's simple, right? I mean, three ways of implementing a simple concept. I totally agree. As with many simple things, however, it does not mean that dependency injection gets implemented easily. You see, most of the times, people learn about it up until this point, talking about how it's simply injecting dependencies from the outside instead of creating them inside classes, explaining how this allows better unit testing and more maintainable and extensible code. Of course, all those are valid reasons. This is the second category of developers we mentioned at the start of this video. But as I said, this explanation up until this point misses the most important part of the concept. And now the questions to be answered in the next episodes. First, are all dependencies supposed to be injected instead of created? When we create a new hash map, for example, is this a bad design? Should we inject it from the outside? I believe we can all understand that the answer to this question should be no, it would be an overkill. But why? Then my next question to you would be, which classes should be injected and which are okay to be created from within. Let's not forget encapsulation, which is the concept of hiding some inner workings of a class from the outside world. Implicit dependencies are very important and should be used. And finally, a third question. What's the issue with the existence of dependency injection frameworks? If you've heard about Dagger, for example, or even used it, you know that it's complex and needs a lot of time to get used to. But why? We just saw those three methods of passing arguments from the outside. This sounds easy enough. It is clear that there is much more to this story, and parameter passing is just the beginning. There is a whole pattern behind the concept, one that is in charge of wiring all the dependencies together and passing them to the respective components. This is a whole set of classes that have no interference with their functional classes. They are a separate part of your application that should only be able to communicate with your functional set to offer created dependencies. This separation of concerns at this high level is the whole idea behind dependency injection, not constructor parameters. And this requires a very solid theoretical background to be mastered. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.